Thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, the research that I'll talk about uh, has been jointly funded by a company in British Columbia, Agrima Botanicals, as well as the uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, which is NSERC, a federal granting body, um, as well as SFU, uh, Simon Fraser University. Those of you that need to contact me after the talk or through email, punja at sfu.ca. So what I'd like to do is talk about some diseases of cannabis, uh, diseases that have been previously unreported, and review some of the moles that can get onto cannabis product and assess some potential disease control methods. Any licensed producer, any grower is going to experience some form of disease or mold, and it's important that we understand what they are and what we could do to manage them. This work was done in Canada, but all of the results, I think, are applicable to any uh, state or region that grows cannabis. So what am I going to talk about? I'll start with the root rot and crown rot diseases. Those of you that are familiar with these Latin names, uh, Fusarium and Pythium. And then I'll move on and talk about Botrytis, which is a major disease, as well as a Penicillium disease. Uh, and then a few of the molds that can get onto cannabis product. And then finally, I'm going to end with a discussion on powdery mildew, which is a major disease around the world. Uh, we conducted sampling in uh, indoor and greenhouse facilities. Uh, very limited field production of cannabis in Canada. It's mostly hemp, and so my work is limited to greenhouse and indoors. So in uh, Canada, probably the most uh, largely expanded industry in cannabis is in greenhouse. We've got growers that previously uh, grew tomato, peppers, cucumbers that are switching over to cannabis production. You can see the highly intensive production system here in this slide. There is also indoor production, mostly hydroponic. This is an old production system a few years back where individual plants are in these buckets provided with hydroponic solution. Uh, now they use uh, rock wall blocks, which are on raised benches and also provided by hydroponic uh, nutrient solutions. So when we first started this work, we started looking at root systems. And as you see on your left is a, a disease or a root rot that causes the browning of the roots. And when we isolate it from that, on your top right is this uh, pretty pink fungus, which is Fusarium. And on the bottom is a Pythium species that we isolated from these plants. We conducted pathogenicity studies. And what that means is that we made sure that the organisms we isolated are able to cause symptoms. Here on your left is the disease or the uh, symptomology caused by Fusarium. And on the right is uh, the inoculation with Pythium. And you'll see stunting and reduced root growth as a result of these organisms. Uh, but otherwise, uh, other, unless you had a co uh, comparison, you wouldn't actually know that these plants were, were diseased. And that makes it quite difficult for, for diagnosis. Here again is uh, results from inoculation experiments. On your left are plants. Uh, on your extreme left is a plant that was not inoculated with Fusarium. On the right is a plant with Fusarium. You see the stunting, the yellowing. And on your right is the internal discoloration of the pith that's due to infection by, uh, by Fusarium. This is not a wilt Fusarium. This is a root in a crown rot Fusarium. Hence, we see the uh, discoloration only in the, in the pith and not in the vascular tissue. In some cases, you encounter Fusarium and Pythium together. And when you do that, you can see that the, the results are lethal. Those plants collapse, whether they're in the greenhouse or under field conditions. The photograph on the right was taken in uh, Northern California. Those plants completely collapsed within two or three days under extreme heat. The roots are completely gone. So one of the concerns with Fusarium, of course, is that the inoculum of the spores can spread from infected areas up onto the foliage or onto the flowers. And more importantly, the inoculum can move sideways onto other adjacent plants, particularly if you're growing in a hydroponic system. It's very easy for spores to move around. In fact, we saw that when we looked at propagation systems where um, these cuttings that were being rooted were actually damped off by infection by Fusarium that had moved through the hydroponic nutrient solution. And on your right, you see colonies of Fusarium that came out from the hydroponic solution. So these organisms are moving through the systems in greenhouses or indoor production facilities. Um, we've also seen cases where um, propagated uh, rooted cuttings that are being sold on the, on the marketplace actually contain Fusarium infection. You wouldn't know this from the dark green leaves, but you see the stunted growth. Uh, 
in some cases yellowing, and in extreme cases the plants actually are dead. And we're seeing a lot of movement of these types of plant materials from one area to another, and that's going to cause some major problems with Fusarium in the future. The other thing we wanted to look at was the growing substrate. A lot of the hydroponic growers uh, use uh, cocoa fiber or coconut husk derived substrates, and we wanted to see whether or not these substrates contain organisms or microorganisms that potentially had uh, the ability to spread, potentially spread either into the air or onto the um, flowers. And we were actually surprised. This is cocoa um, product that hasn't been autoclaved or sterilized, and there's a lot of organisms in there, particularly organisms such as Aspergillus, Aspergillus niger, various types of penicillium species, and other types of organisms. This came as a bit of a surprise to us that um, hydroponically um, manipulated substrates such as this can actually have microbes in them. Here's another slide. Um, those of you familiar with moles, you know this is Aspergillus niger, this is Aspergillus terrius. And again, this is material that comes from overseas that probably hasn't been sterilized and actually contains a fair amount of these pretty awful organisms that have the potential to spread uh, through the plant or um, onto the flowers. So airborne contamination can be a problem. Air, uh, spores that are in the air may land on the flowers, they may land on the roots, and, and after that colonize those particular tissues and potentially result in contamination of product. So what we did is we, we devised a system where we could sample air, and it's a very simple, straightforward system. We take a Petri dish with agar, put it out in the greenhouse or in the uh, growing environment, leave it there for 60 minutes, and bring it back. And what you see in this particular slide are colonies of Cladosporium, colonies of uh, Penicillium that are in the air. And we can monitor and quantify the numbers of these microbes in the air. And what you see here, this is weeks of flower. You see the blue bars, Cladosporium levels start to go up as the plant grows. We see penicillium levels start to go up, and what this is saying to us is that as you accumulate plant materials and plant matter, these molds start to propagate and increase in the environment. This is a, a fairly horrific, horrific in the sense when you look at this, you realize it's completely covered in mold. This was a plate that was exposed to the trim room, and the trim room is where mechanized pruning or, or cutting of buds occurs. And what we're seeing is a, a release of spores from the plant material getting up into the air and then landing back down on the petri dishes or potentially on product. And these are organisms such as Aspergillus here, as well as various penicilliums and Cladosporium species. And this is something that needs to be looked at, I think, in the future where uh, confined uh, spaces that are being used to trim product can actually accumulate very high levels of mold. So we did some scanning uh, electron micro, mi microscopy, and what you see here are the stigmatic hairs that are found on buds of, of cannabis flowers. And you notice the, the spores, these are spores of penicillium, that are actually stuck to the surface of the stigmatic hairs, which is one way for the spores that get into the air to land back on plants and start to colonize those. Uh, here's a close-up. Um, I think it's an awesome photograph because it actually shows you these penicillium spores stuck to the stigmatic hair. These are about three microns in diameter. So what that means is that this magnification that you're seeing here is about 100,000 times. So they look large, but they're actually tiny spores that get onto product. And so what we found is there actually is a penicillium bud rot. Uh, these are the penicillium spores. Here they are again, and we actually were able to uh, identify penicillium species uh, on petri dishes that um, came from these various um, production sites. These penicillium species are diverse. Uh, some of these actually have been reported by medicinal genomics two years ago in a study that they conducted. They were the first to actually report penicillium species on cannabis, and we're seeing a, a diversity of species, penicillium citronum here, uh, and various other species on product, and some of these are mycotoxin producers. Botrytis bud rot is another disease. I'm not going to say too much about this, but it's certainly, um, as seen here, a devastating disease that gets on certain strains and can cause a high degree of devastation. 
I'm going to finish my talk uh, just to spend a few minutes and talk about powdery mildew. That's a major, major disease on cannabis caused by this fungus, Golovinomyces chicoresierum. And as most of you know, or those of you that grow cannabis will know, um, it causes a white powdery appearance on the leaves, on the buds, on flowers, and it makes product unsaleable. We've looked at this organism again in the scanning electron micrograph, and I, I hate to use the word pretty and amazing for mold, but th this is really quite, quite a stunning uh, photograph that shows you the, the mildew spores actually being produced on the surface of the leaf, a cannabis leaf, uh, which causes the white appearance that we attribute to mildew. And actually, uh, in some cases, this mildew has a, has a real preference for trichomes. And what you see here is the mycelium actually coiling itself around uh, a trichome on a cannabis bud. And here it is again. Because cannabis trichomes are sticky, uh, they actually attract spores. And so um, we're actually seeing spores stuck to cannabis flowers because of the resin that is um, extruded that causes these spores to stick to the surface. Okay, so what are we going to do about powdery mildew? Our objective here was to screen uh, six uh, biocontrol uh, reduced risk chemical products. We ended up um, looking at these products shown here, uh, Regalia Max, Rhapsody, which is a bacterial product, uh, Millstop, potassium bicarbonate, uh, Xerotol, which is hydrogen peroxide, Actinovate, and uh, neem oil as six of these treatments to see what effect they would have on powdery mildew. We've set up a, a very, um, very good system for reproducing powdery mildew disease. We used a strain called Copenhagen Kush, which is highly, highly sensitive to mildew. They were grown in these uh, humid chambers for, for two weeks and allowed to develop powdery mildew infection. And then we assessed disease development, and then we started the applications of the products that I mentioned to you. They were sprayed on a weekly basis for four weeks, and then we assessed disease. Here's what you see with uh, some of the more effective products. Powdery mildew disease spreads rapidly. As you see here, within uh, four weeks or five weeks, it's reached uh, as high as 40 to 50% disease. Various products had different levels of control with um, products here that are Regala and Rhapsody providing pretty, pretty good control of this particular disease. Here's a representative um, illustration of, of the effectiveness of these products. Uh, control, Actinovate, Rhapsody, Xerotol, Millstop, and Regalia. Now, none of these obviously are completely effective against disease, but remember, this is a highly susceptible variety or strain. And so in, com in combination with genetic resistance, I think some of these products might be effective. The other thing that this slide illustrates is that we're ready for genetic screening of cannabis cultivars or strains, we have a method now that will allow us to look at whether there are any forms of resistance present in cannabis using this sort of a system, because it's sensitive enough that we can see differences that may be attributable to genetic differences. So just to summarize uh, these results, the, the two products that are registered in Canada, uh, Millstop and Xerotol, are reasonably effective in uh, controlling powdery mildew. Uh, Regalia, which is, which is registered in various states in the U.S., is not registered in Canada, but it is a very good product. Uh, Neiman Rhapsody were not the greatest. They're not registered at this point in Canada. And Actinovate, interestingly enough, which was not a great product in these studies, has now been deregistered de in Canada for various, for various reasons. So I think what I've tried to do here is illustrate some of the important diseases that are affecting cannabis productions uh, in Canada and elsewhere. Um, I tried to show you some of the ways in which these, these diseases spread, the importance of mold in the environment that could potentially land on product, whether it's in the greenhouse, in an indoor facility, or in a trim room. And I've tried to show you that some of the major molds are things like penicillium and cladosporium that can cause uh, issues later on in packaged product. And we've looked at some ways to manage these various diseases. I've illustrated some of the products that we've assessed. There are others that we'll be interested in looking at to see whether or not uh, things like powdery mildew and uh, fusarium and pythium root rot can actually be controlled. So I think the, the need for research on this topic is obviously critical. Uh, we're happy to collaborate with, with people on looking at various types of disease control methods, and I think particularly for screening for genetic resistance. <laughs>
We're also looking at a molecular method to see if we can identify some of these pathogens. This is just a straightforward PCR, and it shows you the various uh, disease organisms that are identified with this test, Fusarium, Pythium, Botrytis, the four species of Penicillium that I talked about, um, Alternaria, which is a disease that's just starting to come on board. We haven't seen very much of it. And uh, this is plant DNA. This one right here, this very unique banding pattern is powdery mildew. We can see powdery mildew very consistently using this PCR test, which uses the ITS region. Three minutes. So I think early detection of disease is very, very important because growers can then manage um, the, the possible outcomes. And I'll leave it at that. Canada is now one week into um, legalized cannabis production. And this research, again, was funded by Agrima Botanicals and NSERC. And I thank Darren and Cameron for their help in this, in this research. Thank you very much. Time for questions? Yes. Sure, thank you. Great lecture and incredible images. You mentioned that one of the species of bud rot can be mycotoxin producing. Any of the powdery mildew? Uh, no, the good news about powdery mildew is it's not a mycotoxin producing organism. So the penicilliums are probably the most notorious, aspergillus, um, as well as alternaria. Uh, there's one report of uh, cladosporium producing a, a mycotoxin, but the big ones are the penicillium and the aspergillus, the ones that are in the air that could potentially land uh, on product. Thank you. 